Welcome, welcome everyone to another episode of the Mushroom Revival podcast. This is a podcast bridging the gap between you, our beautiful, amazing, spectacular mushroom listeners and viewers, and the wacky, wonderful world of mushrooms and fungi. So we bring on guests and experts from all around the globe to tune in and shroom in with us and take us on a fungal journey into the depths of mycology and the world of mushrooms. So we are mushrooming the culture around mushrooms. We are unbelievably obsessed with the healing power of mushrooms. Let's dive in. Today, we have the co-founder and CEO of Microma, which is a really interesting startup that went through the Indie Bio Accelerator program, Ricky Cassini. Thank you for joining us and tuning in all the way from Argentina. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be part of this wonderful podcast. I saw uh, the article on Medium. I think that was the first dive that I really got into Microma. And then I actually took a Indie Bio webinar where your other co-founder, Mauricio, was talking. I think what you guys are doing is amazing. Could you give our listeners a quick origin story and what exactly you're up to at Microma? Yeah, sure. Uh, so let me introduce myself so you are know, you know who you are talking to. I'm Ricky, I'm the CEO. I'm 25 years old, so I'm pretty young. Um, this is my, my first time having a, a startup. I'm a first time entrepreneur and I come from a business background. So not related to life sciences, not related to mushrooms, but I fell in love with them uh, after starting my Chroma. Um, so I, I was working as a business consultant. I was working as a professor of operational logistics and I always loved innovation. Um, and that that's why I, I, I kept uh, curious about it and I, I, I was really curious about biotech and that's when I met my co-founder Mauricio. He's a PhD in biological sciences so he he had the idea actually. He discovered a fungi that could produce a color in the lab and this was the starter of Microma. He showed me what he was working on. He showed me the potential of fungi and all the cool things that we could do together. And I thought that it was perfect, that I had to switch from my traditional shop, doing things that doesn't matter to anyone, uh, to do something related to innovation, to do something that it could create an impact in the world. And that's, that's, that's when I decided to quit my shop and join Mauricio in creating my Chroma almost two years ago now. Uh, so it, also, um, we are a really early stage. And I'm, I'm also 25 and also CEO of a startup that's around the same, you know, uh, age and it's hard, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you've had some nights, especially with something that one is a biological organism. And so they're finicky. And the other thing is it's, it's biotech. And so it's new and, uh, there's a ton of R and D that has to go into it. So. I'm sure you failed a million times and I'm just curious to hear some of those uh, stories of what was kind of the hardest point uh, in this journey for you or continues to be the hardest point. Well, in my case, I had to learn a lot about science, a lot about fungi, about fermentation, about all the technology that we are uh, creating because it was completely new for me. But um, in general, uh, the, the biggest problem is entrepreneurship is like a emotional roller coaster. So you, you, I'm sure you know about it, but sometimes you, you think that uh, everything is perfect and you're doing all right and you're going to change the world. And sometimes you think, hey, I'm going to fail. This is too hard. Uh, I'm too tired. Uh, so that's uh, what's uh, really hard. Uh, always having a startup, not only a biotech startup, but in general. Um, what is also really important is to have resilience, to keep going, and, and to know that 
what you are trying to do is something that we could create a big impact in the world, like I said before, and that's what keep us going. For example, the problem that we had uh, when we were selected for Indibio, so Indibio is the largest life sciences accelerator in the world. We were doing great. Uh, we, we arrived to San Francisco. Uh, we moved from Argentina to San Francisco to be part of that program. Uh, when we just were starting, we discovered that our fungi that we were working with uh, for a few months, uh, it produced mycotoxins. So uh, we couldn't use it anymore because we are targeting the food industry. So that was a huge problem for us. Uh, it was a crisis. We were in San Francisco, a new city uh, with all, all the investors looking at us. Uh, so that was a problem, a huge problem. But we managed to find a way to to find another strain, to keep working, to uh, get the knowledge that we, we develop for the other strain and leverage it for the new one. And we overcome that problem. And, and we, we are having problems every week, in, not that big, but uh, we have problems every week that we need to overcome. And really resilience is what's most important in this case. And what a, what a more perfect organism to partner with and to look as a teacher as as an organism that can survive in space or was found spores were found you know for 60 million years underneath the ocean and still viable or can you know eat uh radioactive uh isotopes in in chernobyl or uh survive in antarctica i mean fungi are one of the most resilient organisms on the planet and they just seem to bounce back from anything that you can throw on them including you know oil uh they'll eat eat up oil eat up oil and and other things so what a great organism to partner with and and just kind of view as a teacher for that resilience and i i think that's you know what what's more fitting uh to work with yeah actually we mauricio show me all the potential of filamentous fungi all the potential to uh, create biofactories using them, uh, bioremediation uh, potential, uh, neuro neurological potential too. Uh, fungi are great, and we believe that they are the future of biotechnology, bioproducts, and that's why we are working with them. We could work with bacteria or yeast that is more common, but uh, we know that uh, filamentous fungi have a lot of potential to be better in terms of producing at better yield, much more scalable, so solve bigger problems, uh, even solving uh, world hunger. Uh, so th there is a lot of things that we can do with filamentous fungi, fungi in general, uh, and, and that's why we are really excited about what we are doing. Yeah, you've definitely been inoculated and that can that's expressed on the shirt that you chose to wear for this video cast. So before we dive into the science and what exactly you're up to, can we talk about the why? Why are you making these non-synthetic dyes? I mean, we, we know this is bad. There's been plenty of reports on the ill effects on children and pretty much everyone, but specifically with, with children and developing fetuses and whatnot. Um, when I met Mauricio, like I said before, he has this idea, but I, I knew about the problem with petroleum-based dyes because when I was a kid, like you said, I had skin rashes all over my chest and I didn't know why. When I stopped consuming, I changed my diet and, and I stopped consuming petroleum-based dyes, ingredients in general, I didn't have that anymore. Now it's not a problem for me, but I know that a lot of kids still have problems when they grow up and of course it's not healthy to consume petroleum-based ingredients but the thing is that they are everywhere uh, they they are in junk food like candies sodas uh, snacks but they are also in healthy food like pickles for example jelly um and in yeah uh, ma many many case uses there are in, in also uh, healthy food, vegan bacon too. Um, so they are everywhere because the pH and thermal stability, the performance in general of petroleum-based dyes is perfect. And also they are extremely cheap. That's why they are widely used. Also because we like to consume food 
that is appealing to our eyes. And that's why companies are using them to sell more, of course. Um, and there are many problems. Uh, there are problems re related to sustainability, but that's not the main issue in our case. That's We think that's a really big problem, but it's not the worst problem. Uh, the health concerns are the worst problem. Uh, I, I had allergies and it, it wasn't that bad, but there are some kids with ADHD, hyperactivity, and even they are related to cancer. So they are not good and people don't don't want to consume that anymore so uh, they are requesting companies to change their ingredients uh, and there are companies that are trying to to switch from petroleum based dyes to natural what natural ones like kellogg's nestle uh, mondelez uh, they all claim that they were going to switch from petroleum based dyes to natural ones i think all of them couldn't achieve that promise yet uh, because there are problems related to, to natural ones. Um, and also related to regulations, uh, for example, California's OIHA is reviewing the use of uh, petroleum-based dyes. Actually, they already said that uh, the amount of petroleum-based dyes that kids are eating is not safe uh, and they, they need to lower it. So that's the, the, first, the first step. Uh, Probably in the future, we are not going to use uh, petroleum-based dyes anymore. Um, we are, uh, the, the market for plant-based ones and insect-based ones that are the ones that are currently used is growing a lot. So related to the natural ones, um, really quick, the insect-based ones come from insects that are called cochineal dye. They grow in Mexico, Peru, and some parts of Argentina too. Uh, you need to grow cactus plants, make the insect reproduce in the cactus, pla cactus plants, then select the female uh, and smash them and extract the color. So it's a horrible process. It's not really scalable. It, they are really expensive. It's not vegan, kosher or halal. That's a problem too. Um, the, the performance is not great either. And the, the replacement for for that one, for that red color, uh, it would be beetroot, but it comes from traditional agriculture. So it's not really sustainable either. It's better, of course, uh, but uh, there is a long supply chain. You need to use a lot of water, land, pesticides, and the performance is not great either, and they are expensive. So we saw a gap there in the market where we could create better natural dyes to uh, to help this transition from petroleum-based dyes to natural ones in a faster way, in a more sustainable way, and also in a cost-effective way. Uh, and that's why we started Microma. I think people really take for granted how colorful our world is these days. I took a lot of art history in college and it was fascinating to hear about the struggles with printmakers back in the day and trying to find a pigment to make blue or purple. And just the stories that came out of this, like the extent that people went through just to get some blue pigment, how much it cost and like the espionage and the spying and like all of the crazy crime that came with other countries trying to obtain this information, you know, whoever had, had founded the pigment first. So I understand why we switched to a petroleum-based pigmentation. It's like you said, super cheap, probably really easy to make, stable, and you can get every color that the human eye can pro possibly process and, and perceive. So I, I understand it in a way, but now that we have the science and the responsibility to notice that these things are actually harmful to us, it's, it's time for the third era of pigmentation, and I think fungi are very promising. We had a whole podcast on fungal dyes, which Alyssa Allen, she's an amazing DIY fungal dye person, and basically she forages for all different types of mushrooms and dyes, wool and other organic fibers with mushrooms. Uh, a lot of times you have to use ammonia. So this is, of course, not something translatable into the food industry. But nonetheless, it really did give an impressive scope on the 
world of pigmentation that mushrooms in particular had to offer. But you are working with the mycelium. You're working with the the metabolites, right? And um, what colors can you currently create at Microma? Uh, right now, we are focused on producing red because red is one of the most used, actually, it's the most used uh, color in the food and cosmetic industry. And that's where we are targeting those two markets. Um, red is also related to to a lot of problems. The petroleum-based red is related to a lot of problems related to health concerns. So that's why we started with red, uh, but we can also produce orange and, and yellow right now. And our idea is not just to produce these three colors that are 90% of the food dyes currently used, but to have a whole a spectrum of colors. We know that fungi have a lot of colors that they can produce a lot of metabolites. And actually, we, we know only about 5% of all fungi on Earth. Uh, that's an estimation. So uh, we the potential that uh, is related to producing other colors or other stable colors, because that's the challenge, right? Um, it's, it's huge, and uh, not only molecules that are color, but also flavors, fragrances, and all these ingredients that that's what we would want to do in, at Microma. We want to create a biotech platform to produce next generation natural ingredients, and not only colors, but in the future also flavors and fragrances using fungi as biofactories. And was this color the one uh, Mauricio noticed first and then thought, that they would he would run with this particular pigment actually no uh it was a pinkish color uh and that's an strain that we are not using because the yield wasn't great and actually we don't know if it was even safe um but uh that was the the starter of of this idea that he had uh he he's a vegetarian for more than 15 years now and he always checks labels of products. Uh, he always checks for animal-free products, right? Uh, but he also saw all the petroleum-based ingredients that, that we were consuming. So he related his idea in the lab with what he was trying to buy, a, a clean label product. And he thought at that time that it was a, a perfect combination and that he could solve the problem uh, with a solution that wasn't out there. Uh, and that's when we, when he decided to look for a partner, for a business partner. And we met uh, at my university one Saturday at 8 a.m. Uh, when I was looking for uh, when, I, when I was looking for biotech projects. So can you walk our listeners through kind of the the process of how this works and how do you go out and search for for different dyes or other fungi that might increase the yield of the red or a different different uh shade of red is it kind of throwing the dart at the dartboard and just kind of collecting as many fungi as possible testing if they produce it is do you you know is it grown in a, a big bioreactor and you just add uh different uh chemicals to it and and see it how it reacts H how does this process work without disclosing, you know, any, any uh, proprietary information. Of course. Uh, so we have, we have a wide collection of filamental fungi. Um, and in this collection, uh, we select the ones that we think that uh, are, are better suitable for our process. Uh, right now, uh, we are not working with all of them, even though we did a lot of research on them. Uh, we are working with one strain and we are creating our own proprietary industrial strain with it. So we want to that we want make what we want to do is make that strain produce all the colors in the future and produce it in a really, really high yield so we can replace the petroleum based dyes. Uh, we are using that strain and we are brewing it in bioreactors. So uh, similar to the production of beer, it's not like a pharmaceutical product, but more like a, a beer, uh, basically. And we are making the fungi produce the color and secrete it to the media. So after a downstream process, a filtration, uh, we, we get the fungi, a, a biomass, and a color media that we can dry 
or we can concentrate depending on the use because for example for cosmetics it's better to have a dry powder for uh, food applications maybe it's better to have a concentrated liquid so it depends on what the the the, one, the company that are, are going to use it uh, needs hey guys if you love the show and want to continue getting tantalizing mushroom content such as this please consider supporting us by going to mushroomrevival.com and purchasing one of our amazing mushroom products. This is how we keep the lights on. This is a total passion project. We do not offer any outside uh, advertisers and this has totally revolutionized our health. We want to spread the mushrooms far and wide in every corner possible. If you're listening to this, we will offer you a special coupon code that we're not offering anybody else. If you're listening to this, this is a little Easter egg that you just found. The coupon code is called PODTREAT, P-O-D-T-R-E-A-T, all caps. And to figure out how much you actually save, you got to figure it out. You got to open that Easter egg as well and put it into your cart to find out a special offering that only you will get. We love these products. They help revolutionize our health, and we want to share that health and abundance with you guys who equally love mushrooms as much as we do. So when you go watch a movie, you get a bowl of popcorn, obviously. So when you listen to mushroom podcasts, you get a mushroom tincture pumping through your veins, pumping through your eardrums. You mm -hmm. are a mushroom. Mm -hmm. Help the mushroom revival. We love you guys so much. Back to the show. So you predict you'll be able to make multiple colors from one strain of fungi. Yes. And you get different colors based on the, the environmental conditions. Yeah, that, that's our moonshot. Uh, that's our moonshot. We think we know that we can do it. Of course, it's going to take a lot of development. And now we are uh, working on our strain to make it produce a really, really high yield of red. And that's where we are focusing to then fund the power of our platform to other colors. The rainbow mycelium. <laughs> I'm assuming you can't tell us the species, but if you can, we'd love to know. Well, it's a penicillium strain. That's what I can say. Um, and we are engineering it to make it our own strain, industrial strain that can make all, all, all these products uh, in a really sustainable and cost-effective way. And what reasons do you have for, for you to believe that it can produce a blue and a purple and a green and other colors? Well, uh, that's more... Um, uh, we know that fungi can produce a lot of color. Uh, we can see that in nature. Uh, and we know that we have the synthetic pathways to do that. So uh, according to, to science, it's possible. We still need to do a lot of development, of course, but uh, we are sure that we can make it with enough uh, funding that we need. Uh, right now, we are a really small team. We are five in our company. We raised a pre-seed round uh, and we are going to look for a seed round soon. So with all that capital from investors that trust us and trust in the power of fungi, uh, we think that we are going to be able to do it. We were doing some research on Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, which is the typical, you know, cordyceps mushroom that a lot of people know when, you know, they've watched Planet Earth or other BBC uh, nature uh, documentaries. And it's, you know, grows off ants, it pops out of their head, you see a lot of the, those cool time lapses. And if you haven't, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, definitely YouTube, uh, Cordyceps, BBC, Planet Earth, and it'll pop up and you can see this really awesome clip. So there's this dye. It's a red uh, naphthoquinone dye that, that the Ophiocordyceps senescence or Ophiocordyceps unilateralis produces. And I can't remember actually what it was used for. If it, if it's a, um, antibiotic, uh, that the, the fungi produces to, um, fight the insects and, and make it, you know, a clean habitat, a habitat for, um, colonization. I could be wrong, but, uh, they, have been using this this dye for 
food, cosmetics, pharmaceutical uh, practices. And they actually, one of the coolest things that I saw was using it for anti-tuberculosis testing and uh, in secondary TB patients um, and improving symptoms, enhancing immunity when combined with, with chemo drugs. Is this uh, something that I know you, you said you're focusing on food and cosmetics is pharmaceutical application in, in your runway at all? Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, we think our ingredients could fit many industries, especially uh, what we are trying to focus is in everything that we put in our bodies. Because, for example, we see a huge problems related to coloring used in textiles. Uh, the production process is horrible. Uh, the conditions uh, of the production is, is it's terrible. But uh, we see a more urgent problem in in what we eat uh, and what we put in our bodies uh, so that's why we are trying to focus on the food industry cosmetic and pharma as uh, as a coloring ingredient uh, we know that our our uh, our dyes also have antioxidant properties so that's that's also really good and a lot of studies have claimed that pigments that are really similar to ours have um, different different activity related to blood pressure it helps lower the blood pressure anti-inflammatory activity antiviral activity and even anti-tumoral activity uh, but we are trying to focus more on the on solving this problem that we can claim that we can solve and um, we could use also our colorants as nutraceuticals but right now we are trying to focus on solving this problem that is really clear and what exactly is making the red pigment is this an enzyme or some other compound a hormone like do you know what it is actually it's a secondary metabolite uh, a, met a secondary metabolite uh, um, enzymes are a primary primary metabolite and metabolite and, and they naturally can produce these pigments. What we are doing is helping them to produce even more and, and, and try to uh, give them the optimal conditions inside the bioreactors so the yield is really good. They usually use these pigments as UV protection, for example. What color do you think is the hardest to produce? I, I heard blue is the rarest color uh, from, from nature. Is that true? Is that kind of your uh, top color that, that you want to get to someday? Yeah, that's true. Uh, blue is really hard uh, because in nature there are many blues and the ones that are viable, mostly they have oxidation problems and also stability problems. So pH and thermal stability. So that's, that's a really tricky color um that the industry is looking for so that's something that we are going to target uh, as soon as we we prove the scalability of our process um we know that it works uh in an industrial scale but yes we are in the look for a, a really good blue color and we already did a lot of research of different ways of of reaching that stable and good performing blue dye so have you heard of the blue stain fungi? I think it has a couple other names too. The green cup fungus, even though it looks very blue to me. Uh, I believe the Latin name is Chlorocyborea. Chlorocyborea, yeah. Yeah. So this grew everywhere in Western Mass. And when we lived there, I we found some mushrooms, which are rare. Usually you just see the stained blue wood. And you don't hardly ever see fruiting mushrooms, especially if they're fresh. And we saw these and we took them back to the lab. I put some on Petri and I was just like, let's, I just want to see what happens. Like, what if it does create a metabolite that's blue? Or if it has something to do with the chemistry of the wood and the cellulose and the lignin that prompts this color, this stain. And sure enough, this Petri plate had the normal white fluffy mycelium. And after maybe a week or two, had all these little beads of dark, dark blue metabolites. It looked almost black. It was such a satisfying, beautiful color. We, we found this on our first date and we went mushroom hunting on our first date and 
it was, we we're probably like a minute down the path. And I was like, so she just moved from Kansas to, to Massachusetts. And I was like, so what mushrooms do you want to find? Like, what are you hoping to find today? And she was like, I want to find blue stain fungi. And I was like, well, you know, it's a little rare. I, I don't know if we we're going to find it. I wanted it. to find the rainbow. I wanted to find a, one mushroom for every color. And we did. We, di Even we green. did. Yeah. She has this, this skill. I don't know what it is, but she'll, she'll say, I want to find this mushroom. 30 seconds later, we find the mushroom. But we're right after she said that, probably 10 seconds later, we get to a fork in the path. And so I'm like, okay, you know, I, I come from a lot of uh, outdoor background. And so usually I'll mark the path like with a stick or something to know when we're walking back, oh, we went that way. So I pick up a stick and the first stick I pick up was covered in this blue stain with the fruiting bodies, with the mushrooms coming out of it. And it was the funniest thing. It was like 10 seconds after she said, oh, I want to find this blue stain fungi. But um, if we find any more, we'll uh, definitely send it to Argentina unless you have it in abundance over there. Please let me know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you looking for a job? <laughs> I won't rule that out. Um, but yeah, have you considered this this fungus or have you worked with it? Yeah, that's one of the species that we are considering. Uh, we need to go through a process where we prove that it is, uh, that it's safe. Uh, for us, it's very important since we are targeting the food industry. For us, it's very, very important to know that they are safe, that they don't produce mycotoxins or an antibiotics, antibiotics. Or, or anything that could harm us. Uh, so that's very important for us. And the other part is also pH, thermal stability, oxidation. So those are things that we need to consider uh, when looking for a fungi. Uh, and also that they grow in a submerged fermentation. So there, there are a lot of steps uh, when selecting a fungi. So we are really, really picky because we need to make it cost competitive. Basically, uh, we need to solve a problem in the industry. But yes, that, that's one of the fungi that we are considering for the blue color. So say you check all the boxes. It has, you know, it can be grown in a bioreactor. It doesn't produce mycotoxins. It grows at the right pH or withstands certain pHs of the food that you're putting it in. Uh, all these different boxes are checked. Once you produce it, what are the the boxes that you have to check in order to dye a food? Does it have to bind to a, like carbs or like what, what, what's the dyeing process of the food? Is it similar as like a dyeing a wool or something like that? Because I know we were talking with uh, fabric dyeing and there's a lot of fabrics that you just can't dye with mushroom dyes or it doesn't do as well. So are, are there some foods or drinks that, you know, uh, good luck, you're not going to, it's not going to work uh, with a, with a fungal dye, or can you manipulate the dye in a certain way to, to have it bind? And, you know, you brought up, it's all dependent on your customer of what they're going to use it. If it's a powder, if it's a liquid. So kind of take us through those steps of how do you make sure it binds with whatever their product, if it's a lipstick or a, you know, a granola bar or whatever, um, how do you make sure it binds? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Actually, for example, carotenoids have a lot of problems when, so, when related to solubility. So when using it and at an industrial scale, you have a lot of problems. Uh, and that's uh, something that we are trying to change with our dyes. They have really good water solubility that it's also an, a really important characteristics for the food industry. Um, and the other two characteristics that are most important for, for the food industry is pH and thermal stability. So food is very diverse from pH three to eight and sometimes 10. And our colorants are stable from two to 10. So uh, is, they are stable all, all, all over all pHs. 
Uh, so that's why we got a lot of interest from companies. Uh, we've been talking with more than 50 of the top companies related to food, cosmetics, and pharma, and even some uh, more uh, world applications like ink uh, and also textiles, of course. Um, but yes, uh, 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 pH stability is really important and also thermal stability. Our dyes, when compared with insect-based dyes and plant-based dyes, have better um, pH and thermal stability than all the rest of the natural ones used uh, nowadays. Fungal food dyes aren't new. I was doing some research after knowing or getting to know your startup, and in Asia, they've been using Manascus species, which I'm not sure if this is the one that you initially started off with and then realized that it produced mycotoxins because that was a big thing in the research I was doing is the Manascus is great. It produces a really productive, deep red pigment, and you can actually get red, pink, yellow, orange, a lot of those colors, but it produces citronin, I think. That was the name of the, the, the mycotoxin. And it has terrible effects, uh, but they successfully, according to one paper that I read, mute, uh, they did some mutagenesis on a few strains, and one of them lost the gene to create the citronin, and they actually increased the yield of the dye. So I'm just curious if you have anything to say about that and what you know about the Manascus species, if you did originally try to work with this one or if you ever plan to. Um, yeah, actually, that's a huge problem uh, because these mycotoxins can kill you. So it's a huge problem. Um, it's it's used it's used to produce the red yeast rice uh, widely in Asia, and it's also used in the states, for example, uh, as a nutraceutical. It's sell, it's sold as a nutraceuticals to lower the cholesterol. Um, but yes, uh, the problem is huge, and that's why it's not widely used. It's not widely used in, in the US, it's not widely used in Europe because of the production of this mycotoxin. Uh, for us, it's extremely important, the safety of our colorants, because uh, we can't uh, test a, a, a new fungi with people uh, and do something wrong, because if we do that, the, we are setting not only a problem for the company, but for all fungi and um, for all new natural dyes. Uh, so it would be against our mission, basically. So uh, we really care about safety. Uh, um, and that's why we only select fungi that can produce mycotoxins. Have you done trials with myco ink? Uh, no, no, we, we haven't. Uh, but we know that they, they have a really good power, a coloring power. I, I can't wait until I, I print off some documents with my co-ink. It's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would be amazing. Actually, the biggest company uh, producing ink on Earth uh, approach us because they want to replace their, their ink, uh, their petroleum-based ink uh, with, with natural dyes. Uh, so they, we know that they are looking for uh, more sustainable solutions. The problem is they are not there yet. Uh, and, and that's what we are trying to provide with Microma, starting with what's most important for us, that is food and what we put in our bodies, to then go to other industries like textile and the ink uh, of printers, for example. What would you say is, is kind of your barriers of entry to per, to be the provider for all these industries i mean it's it's huge and i'm sure that the petroleum based inks they can make unbelievably cheap uh and so you know it's finding the right strain i'm guessing with the right production and without microtoxins and then the infrastructure and funding uh, is there anything else that you know is a big barrier of entry um that is preventing you from re replacing all our, our nasty dyes on, on planet Earth? Yeah, another barrier of entry is regulations. 
the, the dice that we are producing are really good in terms of pH, thermal stability, and everything, because they are novel molecules. Uh, and the problem related with novel molecules and novel ways of producing food and ingredients is that they are not regulated yet. So we need to go through an FDA process that can take, uh, in the best case scenario, a year. Uh, so it's a long process. And it takes also a lot of money to get through that process. Um, but we think that uh, we need to create new materials to solve the problems that we can solve right now. So that's something that we, need, we will need to overcome. And uh, we already did a lot of testing regarding the safety of our dyes. We know that they don't produce mycotoxins. Uh, we tested for xenotoxicity. Uh, we did, if we even consume our dye, so I, I didn't die yet, uh, and, and that's good. <laughs> yeah, I respect that, consuming the product that you make. I feel like a lot of uh, big business won't use the products that, that they make. So you are also marketing your biomass, correct? And is this also for dye, or are you using it for something else? Uh, well, uh, mycoprotein in general is really interesting. Uh, Filamentous fungi that has this uh, filamentous structure that uh, resembles meat. So uh, the, the mycoprotein space is growing a lot uh, as an alternative meat in the plant-based uh, scenario that is booming right now. Uh, so uh, besides the filamentous structure, they have uh, cool advantages like they have a, an umami flavor that can cover and enhance some flavors and you can use less salt for example uh, and those are characteristics of all uh, filamentous fungi uh, biomass let's say of all mycoprotein but our mycoprotein is also color it has a really really deep red uh, and it's perfect for alternative alternative meat replacements and also this color like the color that we are producing, it, it's an antioxidant, and it could also replace some of the other ingredients that are used to improve shelf life. So that's something that we are testing. Uh, right now, we are at the lab scale with our colorants and also with our biomass, um, but we are already testing with companies, and hopefully uh, soon we will have uh, a, a lot of products with alternative protein from fungi, a lot of our colorants from fungi, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and we can buy those products in the shelves. So talking about oxidation, we just figured out, and I, I say we as, as uh, uh, humans, just figured out why psilocybin or magic mushrooms brews blue and what's really going on. And some researchers found that these compounds, or most of them, are quinoid silicyl oligomers. And they're, according to this article that I, I read, not too unlike the indigo dye used to dye blue jeans. And, you know, another, there's actually a, a few different mushrooms that bruise blue when you cut it or when you, you touch it. Some bolete species bruise this really awesome blue you cut it in half and then it just changes blue right before your eyes really gorgeous really awesome i'm sure you know um there are some regulatory issues in argentina uh, in terms of, of growing psilocybin and, and then bruising it but uh i'm sure maybe a bolete it's mycorrhizal so it might be a little harder uh, maybe you could set up an operation in Brazil uh, where, you know, some of those regulations for psilocybin are a little more lenient. But um, have you have you thought of, of using either psilocybin containing mushrooms or uh, Bolita species for blue? Uh, we haven't yet because of that uh, kind of issues. Uh, regulations are a, a really strong barrier of entry. Uh, we investors and companies uh, worry a little bit. They know that they can approve our dyes, uh, and probably it's going to happen if we get the right resources and the right trials. Uh, but they are worried about it. If we add another uh, layer of, of uh, problems, uh, I, I think we are not there yet. But in the future, 
after we get approved our first fungal dyes, um, not only regulations are going to be a little bit easier, but also perception of the community uh, is going to help. Uh, so uh, maybe in the future, but not now. I can't imagine dealing with regulations with the FDA, especially when you're getting involved with international projects. So thank you for being a trooper and persevering through all of that bureaucratic BS. But I understand it and I thank the institutions that enforce it because then we have safe food. Yeah, of course, it's it's really important, the job that they do. Uh, we are on the same side that they are. We want to provide better natural ingredients uh, for food and cosmetics. Uh, and we need to go through those steps to be sure that what we are going to put in our food is safety. So we understand that their shops. But this is also the same institution that's allowing blue five and yellow 40 and red, whatever number. So definitely room for improvement. That, that is going to change. Uh, if we stop consuming uh, petroleum-based dyes, um, they are going to be over. Uh, companies are trying to switch, but if we decide we are not going to buy those products anymore, they are going to switch faster, right? Uh, because they want to produce money. That That's that's what they are trying to do. So pe if people don't buy their their products that have petroleum-based ingredients, they are not going to make money. So they are going to change the way that they are producing. Uh, we are going, we are seeing that in a, a lot of industries, for example, uh, the vegan community is booming. Uh, meat companies are trying to produce culture meat uh, to, to satisfy this, this uh, demand. Uh, so everything is going to change in, in the next few years. Uh, and um, so everything is going to change, not only related to tech, but also to life sciences and to what we are eating. And what an exciting time in the world. And I think to have access to the internet and just, you know, uh, in countries where it's not as regulated as, you know, other countries, and we have access, free access to an incredible amount of information at our fingertips at all times. And so that is, that power is unbelievable and it just supercharges innovation, supercharges R and D and pushing this technology to make the world a better place and to find better solutions for, you know, things that people just take for granted or there is no other way. Um, and that, that barrier of entry. Uh, has has really um, taken taken a few notches down, and so there are so many people that listen to our our show and and tune in from all around the globe, and from all different backgrounds of people just getting into the field, or maybe they work at a mushroom farm, maybe they're they're looking to start their own business, and and seeing mushrooms are booming, they want to quit their job, maybe they're working a nine to five at some you know, uh, cubicle, uh, workplace and, and they want to work with mushrooms. And, and so what advice do you have for our listeners who maybe already have their own mushroom business, uh, are working at a mushroom business, they want to start their own, uh, that want to pursue mycology to, to help world problems such as this? Well, uh, here you have an example. I come from the business side uh, and I, I don't have too much experience. Uh, I, I'm 25 years, 25 years old, so uh, everyone can do it. Uh, I, I would encourage everyone that has an idea uh, uh, and they want to be entrepreneurs and especially in the biotech space, in the mycology space, to go forward and try to... to to make their idea a reality because you can do it. There is a lot of funding uh, nowadays uh, to do that, especially in the US. Uh, and, and that's why we went to the US. So if you, if you are from the US, you are a little bit closer. Uh, this, this space is booming. Uh, biotech is, is booming. What happened with software, hardware a, a few years ago, 
um, now it's happening with life sciences and also mycology. Uh, actually, I was hearing to a venture capitalist a, a few months ago that he said that the next year is going to be the year of fungi. Uh, so watch out because some cool things can happen. Uh, with the latest development on technology uh, related to science like CRISPR or, or how much is lowering the cost of sequencing, for example, every day, uh, open opens up a, a new world of possibilities to to make it a lot of things a lot of things with uh, fungi uh, and and that's what we are trying to do uh, at Microma uh, and we see a huge space that uh, is growing a lot uh, and there are a lot of companies that are trying to be in that space to solve many problems on uh, related to to many problems of the world. Uh, like I said before, world hunger, uh, we could produce mycoprotein all over the world. Uh, we can do bioremediation with fungi. Uh, we can solve uh, mind problems with fungi. Uh, there are a lot of things to do. And, and also, uh, we only know about 5% of all fungi. So let's go, for, let's go to look for, for new fungi that provide solutions like you guys did with that. Uh, blue stick, uh, what we can find in the world. Yeah, we couldn't agree more. And we learn this every time we have a new guest, just how powerful the potentials are and the surprising nooks and crannies of the world where fungi show up and really shine. The, the latest podcast that we just published was all about this fungus that produced a metabolite that blocks the bitter receptors on your tongue. And that was revolutionary for the whole sugar epidemic and, and how we can use this fungus grown in a bioreactor, harvest these little compounds and completely change the way people eat our health. That's just one sliver of what they are currently doing now and what they will do. Ricky, I'm so excited to watch Microma grow. Where can people follow your work? I know you have a website. I believe you also have an Instagram. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, we have a website that is microma.co. Um, and there you can find all our social network. We use Instagram. We use LinkedIn. We use Twitter. Uh, so uh, Facebook too. Uh, we use LinkedIn more, but uh, feel free to, to follow us on, on every channel. And also if you're looking uh, to be an entrepreneur if you, if you are looking into my mycology uh, and you need some help feel free to reach out to me i'm not that hard to find uh, so uh, happy to help to everyone and you said you're about to open a, another round is that right yes uh, we need some capital to scale up production to start going through that regulatory process that we need and yes, we are going to raise uh, around two to three million dollars to to keep us going, to grow our team, to do more developments, and continue creating a a new way of producing ingredients in a more sustainable and cost-effective way. So excited! Yeah, it's amazing. We have one final question that we ask all of our guests on our show, and this question is. If mushrooms had the microphone and could say one thing to the whole human race, what would they say? Well, that, that's a really, really good question. Um, I, I think that they would try to create awareness about the, the job that they are doing for us. Um, they, they are the foundation of Earth. They, they, they help us a lot. They, they are doing a lot of things for us and people sometimes they think oh fungi oh molds they they are disgusting or they are toxic and and it's not like that uh, so i think they would create awareness uh, about all the things that they are doing for us and all the things that they can do in the future uh, and we can work with them to help uh, create a better world amen Thank you for coming on. Thank you for everyone for tuning in and shrooming in to another episode. Hit that subscribe button, hit that like, and reach out to us. We are 
we love to hear from everyone. And so if you have any suggestions for future topics that we should dive into or guests that we should bring on our show, please reach out to us. We love you so much wherever you're tuning in from. We couldn't do it without you. And if you have any other, if you just want to say hi, uh, reach out. We are here and head over to our website at mushroomrevival.com. We have a whole new line of products out. We have a new logo, new new packaging, new products. So check that out if you haven't already. And if you're listening to this and you're not watching, head over to YouTube because you can see a video of this podcast. As always, much love and may the spores be with you.